You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 96, Interwar Air Power Part 5, Schemes and Dreams. This week, I would like to remind everyone that one of the best ways to support the podcast is by leaving a review of the show on your podcast listening service of choice. I think this is a five-star show, but that's up for you to decide. For Air Forces during the Second World War, there are three broad categories of performance during the war. The first category involves Air Forces that entered the war in a rough state and were never given the opportunity to recover. I would put France and Poland as good examples of this. The second are air forces that entered the war in a very good situation, did very well, and then that productivity declined over the course of the war due to their own actions and those of their enemies. The German and Japanese air forces uh, fall into this category. The third category are air forces that got generally pummeled for a bit early in the conflict, but would eventually turn things around. Notable members in this club include the Soviet Union and the United States. Another member in Category 3, and our topic for this episode, is Britain's Royal Air Force. The first few years of the war would not go at all as planned for the Royal Air Force. And if you judge the results based on those plans, it was an unmitigated disaster. Now, I can hear some listeners saying, but wait, Battle of Britain, the few, Spitfires, Hurricanes. And you are correct. There were some really good moments for the RAF. But throughout the interwar period, It was focused on one thing, bombing. And in that role, the early years of the war were very unfortunate. The RAF was pursuing a policy of offensive action, actions that would project its power into the territory of the enemy, primarily by using bombers. And to quote Max Hastings from his 1993 classic, Bomber Command, quote, Seldom in the history of warfare has a force been so sure of the end it sought and yet so ignorant of how this might be achieved as the RAF between the wars, end quote. I would say that Hastings is being a bit too harsh there, but I think the sentiment is right. In 1939 and 1940, the RAF would prove to be fundamentally incapable of doing the thing it thought it needed to do to win the war, which was bomb the enemy on a scale to be decisive. There were two things that saved the situation, though. First, there was a quick shift of emphasis in the last years of the 1930s to put a lot of time and resources into the ability to interdict enemy bombing raids in the form of radar and fighter aircraft. Second, Britain's primary threat, Germany, would prove to be equally incapable of transitioning the Luftwaffe into a decisive strategic strike force. These two things allowed the RAF to survive into the late war period where it would have the aircraft and capabilities to launch exactly the kinds of raids that the pre-war RAF would have wanted. Were those raids as effective as desired? No, but that is a story for like 300 episodes from now. The British belief in the capabilities of strategic bombing were based on the same assumptions that led many other nations to the same conclusions mainly that the speed and performance of bombers would not be matched by the speed of fighters, making interception difficult, and that the destruction caused by their bomb payloads that could not be stopped would be devastating. In the summer of 1936, the RAF was reorganized to separate the various types of aircraft and duties into their own structures. The result was the creation of Bomber, Fighter, Coastal, and Training Command, 
This delineation of duties and responsibilities had the effect of formalizing the split that occurred in all air forces as different groups took on different responsibilities and then competed for the finite number of resources that were available. We will talk about fighter command here in a bit, but focusing on bomber command, their focus was on launching an aerial offensive. Now, the theories behind this drive for a strategic bombing offensive would be mostly formulated in the 1920s, and they would continue into the early 1930s. And some of these were based on some key assumptions, like the number of casualties that each ton of bombs dropped on a city would cause, which was 50, or the fact that bombers would not face structured and concerted resistance because that resistance was impossible. There would be resistance to any sort of technological advance that threatened this basic premise. Or as George Ferris would say, quote, they adopted the future conditional tense about material developments, assuming that marginal increases in the speed of and altitude of bombers would cripple air defense, while ignoring the possibility that other developments could bolster it. The errors were multiplied by the erroneous assumption that just a few raids would wreck an enemy's morale and production. End quote. This would manifest in a tendency to dismiss experiences that contradicted their pre-existing ideas about the strength and capabilities of strategic bombers. Now, these faulty assumptions and the resistance to changing some of those assumptions would cause problems. And some of these issues would be brought to the fore in 1937, when the leadership of Bomber Command passed to Sir Edward Edgar Ludlow Hewitt, and his report that he would write upon taking command would identify several areas of deficiencies that he believed reduced the ability of Bomber Command to fulfill its purpose in time of war. One of the major problems would be around the most important thing for bombers to do. Not carrying bombs, not, you know, being able to hit targets when they drop them, but just navigating to the target. In the modern world, navigation, both for aircraft and for essentially all other purposes, feels like a, a completely solved problem. You can find your location on the Earth to within a few feet of accuracy at almost any moment. During the Second World War, this was absolutely not the case. And so a critical component of bombing targets was simply finding them in the first place. To put it simply, in the RAF, not enough time was spent trying to solve the problem of finding where to drop the bombs. There was no single department in charge of formulating navigational best practices or innovations. For, and for much of the interwar period, the pilots were expected to shoulder a good portion of the navigation duties. But even when dedicated navigators were available, there was often a shortage of men who wanted to do it. There was no real career opportunities for navigators, which meant that men, and many of the best, would try to transfer out of the position as soon as possible. And this resulted in the fact that by 1939, British bombers were navigating mostly by guess. One bomber group commander would estimate that the best that many of his crews could do was to get within 50 miles of a target that was far behind enemy lines. And this was a problem that did not resolve itself at the start of the war. And during the first year of the conflict, bomber command could only guarantee that one out of every three bombers would even reach a target area in Germany. And that target area was defined by 75 square miles. They could only find a box 75 square miles, and it was only one out of three bombers. Such a low rate of target acquisition made it incredibly challenging, borderline impossible, to have the effect that was hoped. Navigation is just one area where optimistic assessments and the kind of assumptions about the power of strategic bombing would cause some important topics to be largely ignored as areas that needed improvement. For example, the assumption that bombers were unlikely to be intercepted meant that little thought or effort was spent on trying to determine the best flying formations or defensive tactics to defend against fighters until the middle 1930s. One of the themes I've mentioned multiple times over the course of these episodes is how the events of exercises were manipulated to fit pre-existing ideas. This would also occur during the RAF exercises during the 1930s, as they were forced to make judgment calls about whether or not bombers were successfully intercepted or whether or not they were able to reach their targets. Optimistic views of the capabilities of bombers would also play a role in the design of the bombers themselves. If you were basing planning on the fact that bombers would be able to outrun fighters, then the easiest way to adapt to a new generation of fighters 
was to make your bombers faster. This could be done a variety of ways, but the easiest was to dispense of any defensive armament, particularly extra guns and gunners, and to instead save that weight to make for faster top speeds. Adding more armaments or actual armor to defend against enemy planes would increase the weight, which would decrease bomb capacity and make the aircraft slower and more difficult to maneuver. During most of the 1930s, engines did not exist that could handle all scenarios, giving enough speed to stay ahead of fighters while being able to bring enough bombs to have an effect and and enough defenses to survive. The speed defenses and bomb load would be a constant topic of debate around which should be prioritized, with speed often prioritized for most of the interwar period when it was possible for bombers to simply outrun pursuing aircraft. But this would be forced to change in the years immediately before the war as new generations of fighters began to enter frontline service that exceeded the speed of the bombers that they would be facing. The development of new fighters, at least in Britain, was driven by the hopes of being able to defend against a German attack. But by developing fighters, the questions began to be asked about how they would be employed to greatest effect. This was a a bit of a sticky wicket for Bomber Command, the leaders of which had spent the entire interwar period evangelizing a bombing theory around the inevitability of bombers reaching their targets. Or, as R.J. Overy would write, quote, To admit that there was a defense against the bomber was to question the whole basis upon which an independent air force had been built. End quote. These questions became more urgent as the British zeroed in on the solution to the problem, like the solution to the bomber problem, and that was radar. From Duhay forward, the inability of fighters to intercept bombers had been based not just on theoretical top speed, but also the fact that it was impossible to predict where bombers would strike. It was impossible to keep enough strength aloft at all times to meet and destroy raids, but it was even more impossible for fighters to take off and gain altitude fast enough to intercept. Radar solved these problems, of both being able to tell roughly where the bombers were But far more importantly, they were on their way at all. The fact that radar existed meant that far more thought had to be given to overall defense of the bombing formations themselves. Escort fighters were also discussed, but they were not a major part of the RAF's plans, and instead they focused on giving the bombers the ability to defend themselves. These efforts revolved primarily around fitting bombers with more weapons, and then trying to design a formation that provided the best use of those weapons, interlocking fire being the goal where bombers would be able to use their guns to support others. This was not an easy problem, especially as new fighters with newer and more powerful weapons, like the British 8 machine gun fighters of the Hurricane and Spitfire variety, and the mounting of cannons in other fighters, which would be one of the armament options of the Messerschmitt ME109. While putting more machine guns on all bombers was explored, there was also some investigations into fitting more weapons onto just a few bombers, creating aircraft that would be flying in the bombing formation but with their bombs removed for more defensive and offensive power. This idea was eventually abandoned. And a lot of these sort of struggles would continue into the war years. You know, defending the bomber formations was a major point of a problem, and it would not actually be solved until escort fighters with the necessary range to escort bombing formations into Germany would be introduced during the war years. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire. Enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty. 
and about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today and join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode where I'd like to tell you a story. That brings us to the conversation about Fighter Command, which would be under the command of Hugh Dowding. Fighter Command was focused on one thing, setting up a system to defend British airspace. One way of approaching the problem was through the previously mentioned radar. Radar was not referred to by that name at this time, and would instead be referred to as radio direction finding. The technology was refined in the years after 1936. By the start of the war, construction had begun on two different radio direction finding systems, Chain Home and Chain Home Low. These systems were rudimentary when compared with radar systems in use later in the war, or even to contemporary German systems, but it was able to perform the function of early warning and the determination of rough raid size and raid altitude. A system of command and control would also be set up so that the information gained could then be quickly and efficiently relayed to where it was needed where it was needed, where air bases where British fighters would be kept ready. Speaking of fighters, the 1930s would be a period of massive evolution when it came to fighter design. The largest change during the decade would be the shift from the biplanes that had been first made and had made their appearance during the First World War to all-metal monoplanes by the end of the decade. This shift was a very clear and generally accepted evolution, but there were still many points of discussion about the details of fighter design. In the same way that bomber design was a mixture of speed, bomb capacity, and defensive equipment, on fighters, the balancing act would be how to maintain the highest levels of speed and maneuverability while also mounting as much firepower as possible and making sure they weren't just made out of paper mache that that fell apart very easily. Positioning of the guns would also take on added importance as airframes were being made more and more aerodynamic and often smaller. They could be placed in the fuselage to fire through the propellers, a system that had been perfected during the First World War through the usage of interrupter gears. But placing more than a few machine guns in that position would create space problems as there was also an engine that had to be worked around. This would be the path chosen by the Germans with the ME-109, with a smaller number of machine guns and sometimes a a cannon as well, mounted to fire directly forward from the fuselage. They did this to avoid the other option, which was to put the weapons in the wings. This would be the path selected by the British for both of their most widespread fighters in the early years of the war, the Hurricane and the Spitfire. Both of these aircraft would initially mount eight machine guns in the wings, The trade-off was that to mount weapons in the wings generally necessitated slightly thicker wings, which resulted in more drag. There were also discussions about what type of weapon should be mounted wherever it might be. The general answer were machine guns, but there was a lot of work put into mounting weapons like the Hispano Souza 20mm cannon uh, into fighters. The cannon would provide far more hitting power and had the option of of cool things like explosive or incendiary ammunition, which made it attractive. This would be an area where the RAF would evolve during the war, with both of their frontline fighters entering the war mounting only smaller caliber machine guns, but then transitioning in later versions to larger machine guns and some 20mm cannons. There would be other areas in which the squadrons of fighter command would need to evolve in the early years of the war. This was very similar to the changes that would have to be made in any air unit when their pre-war training came into contact with an actual enemy. The two examples, or two of the examples of these adaptations, would be the rejection of the close formation of flying that had been the topic of training during the last pre-war years, and instead into formations that allowed for greater flexibility. Another was around engagement ranges, with pilots finding that they had to hold their fire until they were much closer than their training had been based on. While one aspect of Royal Air Force preparation was around theory and doctrine, there was also the small problem of actually building the aircraft required to put those theories into practice. What was abundantly clear in the mid-1930s was that the Royal Air Force, and really most of the British military as a whole, was incapable of meeting the challenges being posed by other nations. The Abyssinian crisis would be the catalyst for a wake-up call, 
What would follow would be several years of the RAF trying to determine the best way to rearm and the most efficient way that things could be done to increase its capabilities. One of the disagreements during this time would be between some leaders of the RAF and civilian political leaders. The British government would begin pushing for resources to be spent on defensive preparations for the RAF, including spending on anti-aircraft guns and a focus on the creation and expansion of fighter squadrons. This was best exemplified in the Inskip report that was released in December 1937, in which Inskip pushed for absolute priority to be given to fighter developments and production. The Air Ministry did not necessarily agree with this emphasis, but its ability to push back was limited. Every type of expansion for the RAF required a concerted effort and specific plans from the government and from the Air Ministry because it would require funding, long-term commitments with industry, and just a general good understanding of where the RAF wanted to be. From 1935 until the start of the war, these plans would be named schemes, of which there were schemes A through M. The nature of these schemes would change over time, as some of the earlier versions were more focused on threatening Germany with RAF expansion as a method of deterrence, while later schemes were focused on drastically expanding the RAF's overall power. Now, I won't go through every single one of these schemes. Um, There's a lot of them, and many of them don't actually end up mattering. But I do want to pick out a few, just, just to highlight some of the important shifts in scheme content during these years. Scheme C would include the goal of reaching number parity with Germany in terms of frontline air strength, which was partially done by continuing to produce older aircraft that were already trending towards obsolescence. Scheme F would be outlined after the Abyssinian crisis, which had laid bare the complete unpreparedness of most of the British military, and due to this, Scheme F would have the explicit goal of bringing the RAF onto a war footing. One of the major challenges in all of these schemes as they evolved, and which would be a a, a bigger problem later on, was that the British were trying to match a moving and ill-defined target. They wanted to be strong enough to match the air power of Germany, but as we discussed last episode, there was some ambiguity about what that actually was. And Germany was changing its own targets on a pretty frequent basis. Every time the Luftwaffe came out with a new expansion plan, it had bigger numbers. This meant that there were often schemes, like Scheme H or J, that were drawn up, outlined, and detailed, and then never put into action because of changes in German actions, new information about their situation, or just a change in focus of RAF and British political opinion. Scheme H is a good example of this with it being drawn up so as to greatly boost British bomber strength to match up with estimates of what Germany would have available in the years after 1937. It was rejected due to this focus on bombers, instead of other options. Scheme J was prompted by the large estimates of German expansion, and so included such politically radical options as forced mobilization of industry and workers. In retrospect, this scheme, had it been put in place when proposed in October 1937, would have had a large positive impact on RAF strength at the beginning of the war. However, it was felt to be too politically impossible, due to the fact that it would have been resisted by industrial leaders whose support was considered essential to the overall rearmament effort. Another scheme was then proposed not long before the Anschluss, and it would have involved generally more modest goals than the preceding ones and the rejected ones but it would itself be scrapped when the Anschluss occurred due to a rise in British concern about German intentions. The last scheme would be M, which would be in force until March 1939, at which point the government abandoned the kind of detailed planning that had been part of these schemes. It was felt that the urgency of the threat was enough to disregard anything that might slow down industrial expansion and output. While the government was working out how best to utilize industry and how best to build up RAF strength, there were many other efforts to try and respond to the planned course of the war on the air. This included preparations and plans for air raid shelters to protect people from the expected German bombing campaigns, which would be formalized in the Air Raid Precautions Act of 1937. Plans were made to use various public buildings and structures as bomb raid shelters. Later in 1938, the Andersen Shelter would be introduced as a way for people to have their own shelters in their gardens at their place of residence. The Morrison shelter tried to achieve the same goal, only it could be placed inside the home. While 1939 was a period of societal preparation for an air war, 
During just the last few months before the war, several aircraft began to enter into service and appear in large enough numbers to be impactful. And new aircraft were being developed and were getting close to being introduced. In July, both the Bristol Bowfighter and the Avro Manchester, which would be the precursor to the Lancaster, would make their maiden flights, with both the Bowfighter and the Lancaster going on to production runs over 5,000. As tensions continued to rise during the summer months, Bomber Command was mobilized on August 1st to begin launching exercises to prepare for war. But even at this late date, the exact purpose of the bombers and how they would achieve their goals was ambiguous at best. Fighter Command would prove to be in a better position, at least when it came to being able to achieve their goal of providing some level of defense against German attacks. But both of them would have their own separate problems when the war started. For example, things did not go at all as planned for the British bombing campaigns. The light bombers that were sent to the continent would perform generally poorly, and the raids launched by medium and heavy bombers were little better. For political reasons, the British bombers, who had been built as this offensive force to counter the offensive forces of the Germans, would spend most of the early weeks of the war dedicated to leaflet-dropping campaigns. Instead of bombing the targets in civilian areas, which the British government did not want to risk due to the possible political fallout, but those civilian areas were the reason that the bombers existed, and they existed to go bomb those spots. But even when they did start bombing those strategic targets, it wouldn't go very well for the first two years of the war. Even as more bomber squadrons were introduced and and they gained the ability to drop far more bombs, Bomber Command would be unable to really achieve its goals. But this was kind of just the reality of strategic bombing in the early war years. It had been a theory that had been built upon incorrect assumptions about how much damage could be done and how that damage would translate into winning a war. I like this quote from Rhetoric and Reality in Air Warfare, The Evolution of British and American Ideas About Strategic Bombing, 1941-1945, to by Tammy Davis Biddle. Quote, During the interwar years, bold claims of the power of bombers were combined with a lack of focused attention on how precisely they would operate in war, and how exactly bombing an enemy might lead to its political capitulation. This inattention to what, in hindsight, seems like crucial and essential detail stemmed from several important causes, but most powerfully, perhaps, from the way in which airmen perceived their world and how assumptions were made about it. End quote. The interwar years were a very challenging period to be an air power theorist or planner. Technology was constantly evolving, and there were a finite number of examples to pull from the past. It only started during the First World War. And most of those examples were from trench stalemates, you know, on the Western Front, that most militaries were doing everything in their power to avoid. Trying to predict the power of strategic bombing would prove particularly difficult because its goals were also so nebulous. Fighter aircraft just needed to be able to shoot down enemy planes. Close support aircraft needed to be able to damage targets on the ground. Reconnaissance aircraft needed to be able to find and document its targets. Bombers needed to be able to bomb targets, but how they should do that, how difficult it would be, and how success should be defined were questions that could only be answered by a raft of assumptions. Some nations would make incorrect assumptions, and they would often pay for those mistakes, while others would make the correct assumptions, and they would experience short-term successes. But one of the interesting things is that, by and large, Almost all of the air forces around the world agreed on how important strategic bombing was. They agreed on how it needed to be done. They agreed on the impacts that it would have. And they were all mostly wrong. It's interesting that that sometimes everybody agrees on something, and everybody's still wrong. And strategic bombing during the interwar period is a good example of that. Now, it would grow and evolve during the Second World War. You know, the bombing raids over Germany in 1945 look nothing like the bombing raids that were attempted in 1939 and 1940. But in many ways, the gulf between what was thought was needed in the mid-1930s and what was actually needed was even wider than what happened between 1939 and 1945. Thank you for listening to this series on interwar air power. Of course, this will not even be close to the last time we talk about a lot of these topics, but hopefully it's, it's been a good introduction to, to a lot of items.
Next week, we're going to start a two-part series on Hungary during the interwar years, which will also include a lot of discussion on air power as, as we move ever closer to the start of the war in Europe with the German invasion of Poland.